Hi, everybody, and welcome to the Course of World History. I am Mr. Samuelson, and today we are looking at the Meiji Restoration, a period of Japanese history that is going to bring them into the modern age. So our essential question is, how did Japan become one of the world's great powers? Well, let's take it back. Let's recall that during the Tokugawa period in Japan, uh, Japan, uh, Japan entered into a period of isolation where they blocked trade with nearly every Western nation. Now, they did this because they feared the damaging influence of European and American culture, more European at the time, but it becomes American culture as well, on the lifestyle of the Japanese people, on their traditions. Um, and by doing this isolationist policy, Japan was able to protect its culture, uh, but fell behind Western nations as they started to advance in technology. Now, it will be the United States of America that ends that isolationist period. Um, and that is due to this fellow right here, Matthew Perry. That's not the right Matthew Perry. Matthew Perry, Commodore and Matthew Perry of the United States Navy. Uh, he arrives in Japan with uh, four ships and asks for Japan to open trade with the United States. That's the guy. That's right there. Yeah, over that way. That's Commodore Matthew Perry, not the guy from Friends. Whatever. All right, so Perry returns about six months later uh, looking for an answer, but when he comes back, he comes back with a fleet of eight heavily armed U.S. warships um, that really signal to the Japanese people that this isn't going to be a choice. Um, you are going to enter into a treaty that will allow the U.S. to trade with you. Uh, Japan does relent to this military pressure, and pretty soon Europe also establishes trade with Japan. So this event leads to the end of a shog the shogunate in a very interesting way. See, it was resistance to this foreign influence. The shoguns finally said, okay, we're going to open up, we're going to allow trade. And there was resistance against that. A rebellion rose up against those ruling shoguns who were going to allow foreign trade. This rebellion was led by a group of samurai that formed the Satcho Alliance. And in 1868, this rebellion succeeds in overthrowing the shogunate. There will be no more shogunate in uh, Japanese history. And they return power to the emperor um, in theory. The emperors in Japan, though, always kind of are semi-powerless. But anyway, the idea is there that the emperor is going to be the power. And as puppets, <laughs> puppet emperors usually are, uh, they picked a young person um, uh, who, uh, Mutsushito, uh, butchered the pronunciation, sorry about that, um, called his reign the enlightened rule or the Meiji rule. Uh, now, this period then becomes known as the Meiji Restoration, and this is the return of um, the rule of the emperors. But practical leadership really does say with the Satcho Rebellion leaders and the leaders of uh, those old dynastic groups. Um, so the rule is not directly in the hands of the emperor. It kind of closely resembles the old shogunate, except for they don't have that one military figurehead, the Shogun. So during this Meiji Restoration, the Satcho and the Emperor realized that their whole rebellion against the Shoguns had been wrong. The Shoguns were right. Japan does need to modernize, that they cannot compete in the modern world unless they adopt a lot of these practices undermines the whole meaning of their rebellion, but eh, we already won the rebellion. The shoguns are gone, we're in charge, and now we're gonna modernize. So the Meiji leaders abandon the feudal system, this old Japanese feudal system that we studied, gone. And they strip the daimyo of uh, all their lands and titles. These are the major lords throughout Japan. Nope, you don't get to be a lord anymore. Nope, you don't get to have your lands anymore. And instead, the reformers start to study Western governments. They look at the American government, the British government, the French government, and they settle on the German imperial model. And in this German imperial model, you have an emperor, 
but most of the government falls under the leadership of the prime minister. And the prime minister really becomes your leading power. And the emperor has the power to appoint a prime minister, um, but that prime minister is largely the government under this Meiji system. And under the Satcho leaders, the prime minister was always one of those uh, Satcho rebellion leaders. All right, modernizing the economics. To modernize its economy, the Meiji broke apart these large land holdings um, that had just a few really large landholders throughout Japan, much as European feudal system. And instead they created a bunch of private farms. So people who had been working for the Lords now got to have their own farm. Yay, this works. But the, in return for that, there's a tax. And the tax is at 3% of the value of the farm each year. Not how much the farm earned, that would be, you know, a pretty small tax. It's 3% of the total value of the farm. This is a very high tax. And um, it's going to pull in a lot of money for the reven uh, revenue for the government. It'll create some discontent amongst the farmers. But the government of Japan is now going to be very wealthy because of this tax. They then use the taxes to then shift that money into growing industries. Japan wants to modernize. They don't want to be a nation of farmers anymore. And so this huge um, increase in spending and in industry comes on the backs of the farmers, discouraging people from going into farming, encouraging them from uh, going into industry and working in these new factories. Japan in this period is really determined to build up that industry and to not be dependent on other nations for their manufactured goods. With this comes the modernization of the military. Um, the industrial sector is growing and Japan is building their military capacities. Uh, Japan is now focused largely on building weapons and in particular a navy. They are an island nation. They know that the navy is going to be the key to their military success when interacting with other nations. And so they start to build a completely modern navy, a modern navy that is better and stronger than uh, most other navies in the world uh, when it is at its peak. Um, Japan also increases the size of their military by instituting a requirement that all men serve in the armed forces for three years. This meant that they had a larger standing military with all those people in their three-year service, but everybody who left the service is also trained. So if Japan needs to suddenly increase the size of their military, they have a lot of trained veterans of that military to draw upon, and they'll have a very well-trained, um, well-prepared uh, fighting force. They also modernize their social structure. Uh, this westernization idea comes with some real positive changes for women's rights, um, beginning with the education of women, which had not been allowed in Japan. It was a very uh, rigid society, patriarchal society. Women did not have any rights. And it starts to come into Japanese society, women's rights during this time. Also, Western clothing, uh, sports become really popular. Baseball in particular uh, is an import into Japan that really takes off, becomes one of the most popular sports in the country. Um, also, Western style capitalism is coming into Japan with the positives, all right? Modernization, industrialization, um, a military that can stand toe to toe with Western societies and the negatives, the exploitation of labor and economic unrest that comes with that. So this Western model of modernization really worked for them. And pretty soon, more so than any other uh, East Asian nation, Japan has adopted ideas, adopted technology, and is coming up uh, in the world, becoming more powerful, more influential outside of their own borders. To speed this process, they invite scholars from throughout the world to come and teach Japanese uh, students. They come to the University of Tokyo. They teach about modern architecture and art styles and engineering and chemistry. And these ideas are just incorporated into Japan, into their growing culture, uh, their modernizing culture, while combining within the uh, traditional beliefs of, of Japanese society along the way. Now, these modernizations, um, modernizing practices really drive imperialism in Japan. 
um, it catapults Japan to the very pinnacle of the uh, region in terms of military power. They are far superior to anybody else uh, who lives in this region. And Japan will use this military superiority to expand beyond their three main home uh, islands. Um, this expansion will lead to the conquest of Korea, uh, first in highly influencing Korea and later the conquest of it. Um, they'll take some islands from China. They take uh, Taiwan, Formosa from uh, China. They force China into uh, trade deals that... Um, that, for, that give Japan special trading privileges that the Chinese didn't want to, but now they have to. Japan is really starting to grow and flex its muscles. Uh, in a later time period, we'll talk about how this continues into actually capturing territory in uh, China and pushing um, into the Pacific Islands. But that's a little outside of our times, uh, timeline for now. What isn't is the first major war between Japan and a Western power. Now, largely due to racist beliefs about the superior, superiority of white people, uh, Russia really underestimated uh, Japan and winds up provoking a war with them over some conflicts in the uh, you know northern parts of the Sea of Japan um, and out here. Uh, so Japan and Russia are coming head to head. Russia is being totally dismissive of Japan, um, not taking them seriously. Japan is getting fed up with being treated like a inferior nation, and it prompts a war, a war that Japan is ready for and Russia is really not ready for. So despite all this Russian propaganda that they are, you know, the great giant Russian bear and the Japanese have no, they have no chance to win against us. <laughs> the Russians are just crushed. Um, and when the Japanese surprise them at first, the Russians just say, oh, you know, we were surprised. We weren't ready. We're going to send this major fleet over. And once our real military gets there, uh, we're going to smash the Japanese. And as soon as the real fleet gets there, it takes them six months to sail around the world to get there. As soon as they arrive, the Japanese just blow them out of the water, um, forcing Russia to admit defeat and forcing the entire world to realize that Japan has now arrived. They are now a major world power. All right, so that is it for today. I do hope you learned something. I'll see you next time. Farewell.